interactive, at least in the beginning, I just from a perspective, my own unique perspective, how many people believe that America's opioid epidemic had its origins within the last 10 years? Show of hands. 10 years. Okay, one person. Honest person. How about in the last 25 years? How about we had its origins in the last 150 years? Yeah, that's right. All right, Americans have always loved narcotics. And I'm going to show you some history that's going to be mind-blowing because the lay press doesn't do justification to what's really happened in this country. You know, we have an organization in this country it's called ATF, right? Alcohol, Tobacco, and Fires. How are those three disparate entities even remotely related? Well, they're related to the addictive behaviors of Americans, right? Americans love alcohol. You can substitute the word opioid for that. They love their firearms. They love their tobacco. Our problem in this country is not related to the manufacturers or the physicians or the distributors of opioids. Our problem is a uniquely American problem as Americans consume 75 to 80% of all the narcotics in the world. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to solve the problem. And you're not going to believe it because it's not going to be an easy solution. It's going to be a painful solution. So a little bit of background about myself. I'm a professor of both surgery and anesthesiology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine here in Chicago. I'm the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center about six miles due north of here by Wrigley Field where the Cubs play baseball. I'm on the board of directors of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians and I have some sponsored clinical trials, none of which affect my discussions today. We have some learning objectives. I really want you to understand that we're not in a uh, brand new phenomenon known as the opioid epidemic. We're in the current American opioid epidemic. And I want you to really know that and focus on that because our solutions are not to put physicians in jail or to uh, levy huge fines and taxes against the manufacturers and the distributors of opioids. That's not going to solve our problem. I want to talk about, however, the impact that the pharmaceutical industry has had on the opioid epidemic and future options. So let's talk about the past. So in the past, and this is actually taken from a, a peer-reviewed medical journal, there's a misspelling. It says opium was synthesized in 1804. No, opium, opium's been around for centuries, right? Morphine was extracted from opium by Frederick Sir Turner in 1804. Who was he? He was a 21-year-old pharmacy assistant working in Austria. And he was tinkering around in the basement of the pharmacy with opium. And he was playing around. He, he crystallized this new chemical called morphine. So in 1804, we had morphine for the very, very first time. In 1853, in Scotland, another physician named Alexander Wood created the hollow needle and syringe. 
But before we had morphine, we only had opium as laudanum. Now what was that? Laudanum was a liquid preparation of opium that you could utilize for any of the maladies that affected us on a day-to-day -day basis, right? If you had sleep disturbance, if you had diarrhea, if you had a cough, if your kids wouldn't go to sleep, you could take this chemical and rub it on their lips and that was laudanum. Highly addictive liquid preparation of opium, very widely used without a prescription, just available on the street, buy it in dime stores. Frederick Sir Turner, 21 years old, Austrian. Uh, he wasn't even a full-fledged pharmacist. He was an assistant, and he was tinkering around in the basement, and he was able to crystallize morphine, an amazing accomplishment in this world of pain analgesic medication, uh, 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 the search, the search. So he was the first one to isolate it. So as I said, uh, in Scotland, Alex Wood, Alexander Wood, created for the very first time a hypodermic syringe needle. He thought you had to inject medication including morphine directly at the site of action for it to be effective. Other individuals recognized that you could inject morphine anywhere in the body, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, or intravenously, and have an enormously profound effect by the use of morphine. morphine. So what does this correspond to 1853? Well, it's immediately preceding the American Civil War. And so in the American Civil War, we had the first American opioid epidemic. Most of you know about the battle casualties and the people that died from infections in the American Civil War. 620,000 Americans died in the American Civil War. That's equivalent to all the other Americans that died in all the other wars combined. World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, the conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and across the globe. 620,000 deaths. So we know that phenomenon. We know that it was the deadliest war in history. But what we don't realize is that there were 400,000 Americans who were, who were affected by and addicted to morphine. In fact, morphine use was called soldier's disease because it was so rampant and so readily available. Without a prescription, without seeking a physician's input, you could just get morphine. Now we have the hollow needle, we had the hollow syringe by virtue of the gift bestowed upon us by Alexander Wood, by virtue of the fact that Sir Turner, Frederick Sir Turner had isolated morphine we now had the ability to render patients insensate, or people insensate, when they were getting amputations, when they were suffering from their battle wounds, or when they were recovering from their infections. 400,000 addicted Americans. How do we know that number? Well, we don't really know. There were no smartphones or cell phones. There was no mass media. It took a week to print a newspaper. But we just know by the volumes of sales and distributions of narcotics during that time period of 1861 to 1865 and thereafter, because the vast majority of individuals who became addicted to morphine did so at the conclusion of the Civil War. And so we called the use of morphine soldier's disease. But make no mistake about it, there were almost half a million Americans addicted to the use of this very potent analgesic medication. And they were using it for all sorts of maladies, for cough, for strep throat, for dysentery, diarrhea, sleep disturbances, sexual disturbances, anything you can think of people were getting morphine prescribed to themselves. So what happened? Well, in the United Kingdom, C.R. Uh, Alderwright, who was a physician, an extremely gifted man, who actually died at a very young age due to his diabetes, he was able to say, to look at the American phenomenon and say, those blokes over there across the ocean, the big pond, they're getting addicted to morphine. Let's create a compound which is less addicting to morphine, but which still works for pain control. So what did he create? Heroin. Because heroin is diacetylmorphine. It's two morphine molecules bonded together. And all the right hypothesized that this new chemical, this heroin, would be an enormous contribution to medicine. And he was only partly correct, because obviously that created its own unique set of problems. The substitution of heroin for that of the use of morphine. So what happened next in the annals of, of the distribution and the sale and the production of narcotics in this country? Well, you've all heard of Bayer aspirin. We all have taken Bayer aspirin probably, right? Our grandmother had it on her shelf. We all kind of used it for our headaches and for our, those who had menstrual pain and so forth. But the Bayer company for a 15 year period from 1898 to 1913 made their money, not from selling aspirin, but from selling heroin. That's right, the number one product that the Bayer company manufactured and, sale and, and sold and distributed was not aspirin, but was heroin. So why did they stop the sale and distribution of heroin acutely or abruptly in 1913? Anyone know? Well, they did so because that came immediately preceding the Harrison Act of 1914, which we're going to talk about. But what else, what, what else were we using drugs like morphine for? Well, we were using morphine 
to treat cocaine addiction. So this is really a, this was a unique process which was created by uh, Sigmund Freud in Austria, and one of his uh, prized patients, who actually had never met Freud, was known as William Storr Halstead. William Storr Halstead created the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. He was also considered to be the father of modern American surgery, but he was also one of the world's most notorious cocaine addicts. So to get off cocaine, Johns Hopkins shipped Halstead over across the seas to Austria, and there the minions of Freud administered morphine, and sure enough, they did indeed get Halstead liberated from the effects of cocaine, but he became a raging morphine addict, one of the world's most gifted surgeons and the creator of many of the pathways which continue to be utilized in modern American surgery, William Starr Halstead. So we've talked about the creation of morphine, the creation of the hollow needle and syringe, 400,000 Americans acutely addicted during the American Civil War. Well, what happened then? We started to come into contemporary times in the last century. The first pain clinic, which was created in Seattle, Washington in 1935 by the distinguished John J. Bonica from the island of Philicuti, right outside of uh, Sicily. It's a small island with about 250 inhabitants. And here's Bonica. I had the privilege of not only meeting Bonica and having him serve as one of my many mentors, but I also anesthetized his lovely wife, Emma, in, the, in New York City in the 1990s when she came in for a botched eye surgery repair uh, under the auspices of Dr. Stephen Opsbaum, and Bonica was the father. He's considered to be the most distinguished character in all of American history as our forefather of modern American pain management, writing the first textbook in 1953 called The Management of Pain. So what happened? How did we get to our most recent crisis? Right? We had the American Civil War without any question whatsoever. That was the start of the epidemic of narcotic consumption and misuse in America. In 1875, in the distinguished city of San Francisco, we had the first drug laws. Now, why did we have drug laws in 1875 in San Francisco? Well, San Francisco was overrun by Chinese immigrants. Why did they come to San Fran? For the gold rush of 1849, you've heard of the San Francisco 49ers. There was a gold rush that brought Chinese immigrants in. The Transcontinental Railroad, was, which was completed in 1869, brought more Chinese in. And when there was no more, no more gold to harvest, when there was no more railroad to build, the Chinese stayed. And they created a huge problem to the mass population of San Francisco, right? They created dens of prostitution, dens of iniquity. They, they created drug problems. They created, uh, in addition to prostitution and drug dealing, they, they had a lot of uh, slum areas. There was human waste littering the streets in San Francisco. Yeah. Almost exactly as we find today in 1919, nothing has changed in San Francisco. And so the first drug law was created to eradicate the Chinese essentially, to make it illegal to keep or frequent opium dens or smoke opium. The second drug laws came on the heels of an editorial published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1900, which proclaimed that there was a new problem involving drugs, and that was amongst Southern Afri African Americans who were prone to the use of cocaine. This is one of the uh, opium dens in San Francisco. And what happened next? Well, up until 1906, from the Sears Roebuck catalog, you could buy opium, you could buy marijuana, you could buy cocaine, and you could buy morphine without a prescription. You could just write to the manufacturer, Sears Roebuck, they would sell you hollow syringes and needles and as much narcotics as you could possibly consume. Then we had the Pure Food and Drug Acts of 1906, the same year, that required for the first time the labeling of patent medications. In 1914, we had a, a, the first breakthrough in trying to control the rampant use of narcotics and cocaine in the United States. It was called the Harrison Act. Anyone ever hear of the Harrison Act? It was named after Francis Burton Harrison, who was a Democratic representative from the state of New York. Very interesting character. He had been the mayor of Philippines, of the island of the Philippines, married five times. So, you know, yeah, very unique guy. And Harrison said, you know, we've got to regulate the sale, the distribution, we've got to tax this. So does this sound like anything that's in contemporary America, right? We want to tax marijuana use, we want to tax all these chemicals that our populace is intent on consuming. So the Harrison Act, 105 years ago, was the first attempt at doing that. Before that, this is an actual excerpt from the Sears Robot Catalog, it's 1906. You could buy laudanum, you could buy morphine, you could buy cocaine and heroin and syringes directly for pennies on the dollar from the Sears Roebuck character. Now, Francis Burton Harrison was a, indeed a unique character. His law is a landmark law that changed the landscape of American addiction probably forever. And he was also noteworthy for having died on the very same day 
that I was born in the very same hospital that I never met. <laughs> so he died on my birthday. So what happened next? So we had a little bit of a respite, right? Drug use in America always continued to be uh, an incredible problem. In 1980 and 1986, however, things really started to ramp up. Why did they ramp up? Well, there were two articles that were published in peer-reviewed literature, one in the Journal of the uh, American, I'm sorry, the New England Journal of Medicine by Jane Porter and Herschel Jick. And it was really a letter to the editor. I'm gonna read it to you in just a moment. They said, addiction is rare in patients who are treated with narcotics. And they looked at 40,000 hospitalized patients only found four cases of addiction. So, in 1986, Russell Portnoy and Kathleen Foley, working at Sloan Kettering Memorial Hospital in New York, did a, a small review of a total of 38 patients that said the same type of thing. Chronic use of opioids in non-malignant pain is okay. Patients don't get addicted if you're treating them for pain. Well, guess what happened? The pharmaceutical industry took these two articles and ran with it, right? All the manufacturers thought that this was a panacea. This opened up the floodgates because now they had established peer-reviewed medical literature which proved that addiction doesn't follow the use of narcotics. I'll talk about mental freedom momentarily. So this was the actual letter from uh, Porter and Jick. And what they did was they looked at 40,000 hospitalized patients 11,882 had received narcotics, and they found only four cases in hospitalized patients who acutely received narcotics of addiction. The development of addiction is indeed rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. Well, this is, this is great news. If you're the Purdue manufacturer or you're creating Oxycontin, Oxycodone, and you have this in your hand, you can take this to all your doctors and say, why are you not prescribing my drugs? Look at this. This proves that if you're using narcotics for legitimate medical purposes, no harm befalls any of your patients. Then Russell Portnoy, who's largely considered to be one of the evil geniuses behind the opioid epidemic, and I'll explain why in just a moment, working at Morrow Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City, he and Kathleen Foley studied a total of 38 patients. Now, anybody who studies medicine, who writes publications, who reads the literature knows that that's an extraordinarily small sampling. And what did they say? 38 cases, Portnoy and Foley concluded that opioid maintenance therapy can be a safe, salutary, and more humane alternative to those options of surgery or no treatment in those patients with intractable. They're not talking about cancer pain, they're talking about back pain, they're talking about toothache, talking about bunion pain, non-malignant pain, and no history of drug abuse. And so this, in addition to the letter of Porter and Jick, was taken as fodder by the pharmaceutical industry to go and run and start to sell and mass produce and distribute large quantities of narcotics. So the Wall Street Journal revealed, revealed that Portnoy had disclosed relationships with dozens of companies, most of which produced narcotics. Now go figure, he's going out and lecturing across the world about, about the benefits of narcotics and the manufacturers that are selling and distributing and creating these products are taking that information and running with it, but he claimed he had no conflicts of interest. Interestingly, the American Pain Society just closed its doors about four or five months ago. Why did they close their doors? Because Russell Portman went on the offensive. To try to protect himself, he started saying that the American Pain Society was promoting the use of narcotics to manage chronic non-malignant pain because he's now become a turncoat, realizing that the heat is upon himself for all the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he earned being a spokesperson for narcotics. He's now turned the tables to try to keep himself out of harm's way. I just want to mention this gentleman in passing. He's a very unique leader in the world of chronic and non-malignant as well as malignant pain. His name was Victorio Ventafrida, and he died about 11 years ago in Italy. The reason why I mentioned him, he was a good friend of mine. He studied under the same uh, institution where I'm from, where I continue to be a professor of surgery and anesthesiology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine here in Chicago. But Ventafrida, who created the World Health Organization, in addition with John Bonica, also created the World Health Organization's stepladder approach for managing pain. Why is that important? Well, because if you look at the stepladder approach for managing pain, it says that we should never give patients or should not use narcotics in anybody who's got a pain level below four out of 10. So we have what's known as mild pain, one to three out of 10, moderate pain, four to seven out of 10, and severe pain, eight to 10 out of 10. And for those patients who have mild pain, that is a one to three out of 10 on an numeric pain rating scale, narcotics are not indicated. And we should only use very short acting and short courses of narcotics for moderate pain. That's four to seven out of 10. We should use other drugs like acetaminophen. 
non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, gabapentin and the derivatives, local anesthetics, but not narcotics. We should only reserve the powerful, most potent narcotics for extremely severe levels of pain. So this was written in 1986, and it continues to be true today, 33 years later. So what's going on with our so-called opioid epidemic, right? We all read about it. President Trump is talking about it and declaring a war on the opioid epidemic, and people are going to jail, and manufacturers are getting fined. But really, this is nothing new. Americans love drugs, right? We consume 75 to 80% of all the narcotics in the world. Why? Is your protoplasm dif different from somebody in Germany? Or is yours different from somebody in Sweden or in Mexico? No, this is an American phenomenon. And the basis and foundation of the epidemic is Americanism, just like ATF, totally disparate concepts, alcohol, tobacco, and firearm. How do you lump those three things together? They're addictive behaviors. Americans love firearm. I'm not critical of that. Americans love tobacco, okay? And they love alcohol, or you can substitute opioids for that, some type of mood-altering chemical unless we change the culture at the base level in infancy and in childhood, we're not gonna make a dent in this opioid epidemic because to be American is to love addictive behaviors. So let's talk about what's happened more recently. About 12 years ago, three of the top executives at Purdue Pharma were indicted, but they were never formally, formally charged and they all got off pretty much scot-free, but they paid a fine. The company paid $634 million. It's a big number. But for their gross uh, uh, returns that year of $2.8 billion, it's relatively okay, it was acceptable. And that was for misbranding. Now what does that mean? Well, they were sending their pharmaceutical representatives door to door into small mom and pop doctor shops and practices across the country saying, you can use Oxycontin, you can use Oxycodone. See, we've got these peer reviewed articles from Porter and Jick and from Foley and Russell Portman that say that patients don't get addicted when we use narcotics responsibly to manage pain. The Sackler family, you've heard about them? Because they're on the run. They were big socialites in New York City. They created one of the wings at the Guggenheim Museum. Now they can't even get a table at any at the McDonald's on Fifth Avenue, right? Because they've been pushed out of New York back to Massachusetts. That they're a Fortune 500, 15 or 14 billion dollar company. And this is their headquarters in Bristol, Connecticut. So let's talk about the Joint Commission. Anyone ever hear of the Joint Commission? We know that they that they certify hospitals as being okay for business, open for business. Of course, they remove and try to indemnify themselves against any culpability with the opioid epidemic. But guess what? In the 1980s, they produced a primer or a guideline for clinicians, and it was supposed to be for the rational, responsible, reliable use of narcotics in hospitalized patients. Who paid for that primer? Purdue Pharmaceutical, Purdue Manufacturing paid for the primer that the Joint Commission utilized. And in the primer, there's a statement that says, the attitude prevails despite the fact that there is no evidence that addiction is a significant issue when persons are given opioids for pain control. Well, who's in cahoots with whom? Who's paying off whom? Purdue Pharma bought and sold this primer, and the Joint Commission loved it and took it. You won't find this anywhere, but this is available. Let's talk about more recently what's been going on. Well, we know that about 11% of adults have chronic daily pain. We know that opioid prescription writing had increased between 2007 and 2012, after which it's actually leveled off. I'll show you the statistics. About almost one in every American, on average, by percentages, by numbers, has received an opioid prescription as of 2012. In uh, 2013, the diagnoses, we, we knew that at least two million Americans have used or were dependent upon opioids. But here's the most staggering statistic of all. It's the last line on this slide. Okay. <coughs> I'll get to the deaths. There were about 88 persons dying per day in the United States of 2014 from drugs. Now the statistics suggest about 130 Americans died every single day from drug abuse. But I'll tell you why. So Americans, we have 325 million Americans. If you do the math of 7.2 billion world population, we are a mere 4.4% of the world's population. One out of 25 people in the world lives in the United States of America. We consume 75 to 80 percent of all the narcotics in the world. How does that happen? How does four percent of the population of the world consume 80 percent of the narcotics? Should we put people in jail because of that? Is that this doctor's fault over here? He's a great guy. I trained him. He was my resident fellow. Amazing guy. No. Should I go to jail? No. Should the manufacturers pay billions of dollars? Well, that's that's the American way of solving problems. Put people in jail. 
and levy heavy fines against them. This is a uniquely American phenomenon. It's part of our culture. It's indoctrinated in who we are. This is an actual statistical table going back to 2000 that shows you the proportion of narcotics consumed by Americans. Almost every molecule of hydrocodone in the world is consumed by Americans. Drugs like Lortab and Norco. Americans uniquely take that medication. Of the other drugs like oxycodone, we're a little bit less. But in aggregate, anywhere from about 68 to 78% of all the narcotics in the world are consumed by Americans. Well, what's really happening here, and there's a lot of criticism about our president who wants to tighten up border control, but in, in reality, most of the drugs that are killing people are not what's coming out of prescription uh, uh, pads or out of physicians' offices. It's illicit narcotics, including fentanyl, that are streaming across our borders. They're built in China as powder, they're packaged, and they're sold and distributed, making their way into the States through Canada and, yes, through Mexico. Here's an actual seizure from January 2019 of 650 pounds of fentanyl and methamphetamines. So what is fentanyl? Well, fentanyl is a narcotic that's 100 times more potent than morphine on a weight basis, on a milligram per milligram basis. And on February 22nd, 2019, James McDonald, the Assistant Secretary for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, classified fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction. How can a, a drug be a weapon of mass destruction? How can that be? Well, we've known for, for a very, very, very long time that fentanyl and carfentanyl and low fentanyl, those are long-acting, potent narcotics. They are weapons of mass destruction. How do we know? Go back to 2002, 17 years ago in Moscow. There was a siege situation. The Chechen radical militant group, special purpose Islamic regiment, stormed a theater in Moscow. There were 900 theater goers in this theater, and there were 40 Islamic terrorist rebels, and they held hostages these uh, theater goers demanding the release of other Chechens who were held in Moscow prisons. Now the Spetsnaz is a very special organization, very secretive organization in Russia, a hybrid between our mafia and our FBI kind of. They kill a lot of people. But they didn't know what to do. They had 900 hostages in this theater. So what did they do? They called the United States <coughs> FBI. They said, how are we going to liberate these hostages? And so the FBI didn't know what to do, so they called Theodore Stanley. That's a picture of me with Ted. Stanley from the University of Utah School of Medicine. He was an anesthesiologist and a pharmacologist and a multi-billionaire, one of the most brilliant people on the planet. But he was also known as Dr. Fentanyl. Why? Because Dr. Stanley worked with Paul Janssen. Paul Janssen created many of the compounds that we use in our operating rooms, the fentanyl derivatives, Remy fentanyl, low fentanyl, car fentanyl. These are big game animal tranquilizers. And he also created fentanyl. He was called Dr. Fentanyl. And the FBI said, Ted, we've got a problem here because Ted was on lockdown, because Ted had all the secrets to these great chemicals. How are we going to liberate these 900 hostages in this, in this theater that are being held by 40 Chechen rebels? He said, you're gonna take fentanyl in very small doses, you're gonna put it in a ventilation system, and you're gonna anesthetize the whole room. And that was a brilliant idea, except that the rebels had gas masks on. And so what he did, and of course, the Spetsnaz, being stubborn Russians, pardon me for the Russians in the room, decided that they were gonna give five or 10 or 20 times the dose that Stanley recommended and ended up killing 130 of the hostages. Well, they had a very pleasant death. They fell gently off to sleep. Their respiration started to slow down from 15 breaths a minute to eight breaths a minute to four breaths a minute and then zero breaths a minute. And they died in a very peaceful slumber. And of course, then the Spetsnaz stormed the theater and killed the remaining uh, rebel that were holding the people hostage. But Ted Stanley was a unique character. So fentanyl is a weapon, potentially, of mass destruction. Now, when you look at the narcotics or opioid epidemic in this country, what is often forgotten is that we also have a problem with mood-altered chemicals of the type that are stimulants, amphetamines, and related compounds, modafinil. Why? Think about it. Think about it. Why do Americans, why has there been an 875% increase in prescription writing for amphetamines? in conjunction with narcotics, because Americans just don't want to feel sleepy and drowsy with their narcotics. They want to have the analgesic benefit of narcotics, but they want to be wide awake while they're doing it. Right, they want to be picked up and pepped up, they want to go to Starbucks, drink their Starbucks, take a little modafinil, and then go get their Oxycontin, their Oxycodone, their Norco, their Lortab, so they can kind of suppress all of this. It's kind of like what John Belushi was doing back in Hollywood, California a few years ago. A little bit of heroin, a little bit of cocaine, up and down. This is what Americans do, we love to be put down, but we also want to be raised up so we can feel the effects of those opioids. Now this is a very important statistic and I encourage you to pay attention. 
So we have 70,000 deaths in America every year from all drugs, not just narcotics, not just cocaine, not just methamphetamines, not just methamphetamines. Americans die on the order of 70,000 per year. Soldier Field holds 61,800 patients. If you filled up Soldier Field where the Chicago Bears play football and included all the vendors and all the police and all the ancillary people, let's call it 70,000. If you were to bomb that stadium once every year and kill everybody inside, that's how many people die from drug use and drug overdose in this country. Interestingly, and this is the most important thing I tell you today, so please put your phones down, put your books down, pay attention. What is killing Americans are not prescription drugs, but synthetic narcotics coming across the border from Mexico, coming across the border from Canada, and getting into our citizens. Synthetic narcotic use, it's that yellow line on the screen, has had an astronomical ascension in being the culprit for what kills Americans in terms of drug overdoses. And you can see almost 30,000 of those 70,000 deaths are due to synthetic narcotics, whereas only, um, only 17,000 are due to prescription medications. Look at this. Any opioid, whether it's synthetic or prescription, about almost 50,000 Americans die from opioids every single year, and that's on the incline. However, and this is the most important slide here, What's killing patients, what's killing people, what's killing Americans is not prescription narcotics. That's actually relatively flat or going down. The top line shows a decline in prescription-related deaths. What's killing individuals in this country are prescription drugs with synthetic narcotics. Skaggs, the baseball player for the California Angels who just died, died of prescription oxycodone, which he illegally obtained, laced with fentanyl. So the people who are dying are mixing and matching. These are not legitimate deaths. People are dying from buying narcotics on the street, primarily fentanyl. Where is it coming from? China. How does Chinese get it over into our country? Through Canada and Mexico. How about heroin use? Heroin deaths, again on the top, going down. Heroin deaths alone are actually on the decline in the United States of America. What's killing patients then? What's killing people? The use of heroin plus other synthetic narcotics. What about cocaine? Are cocaine deaths up in this country? No. Cocaine deaths are pretty much flat across the board. What's killing people who use cocaine is cocaine with other synthetic narcotics. What about benzodiazepines, drugs like Xanax and Valium and Ativan that people love to bring them back down? Is, it, is that killing people? Well, that's pretty much on a very stable course for the last 15, 18 years. But what's killing people is when they mix benzodiazepines with other synthetic narcotics. Do you see a pattern here? What's killing people in this country is not what doctors are doing, not even what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. It's the synthetic narcotics that are becoming rampant, easily available, and extremely dirt cheap to purchase. That is what's killing Americans in this country. Make no mistake about it. Now, how do we know that? Well, this is a very interesting article from 2018, okay? The Center for Disease Control that started some of the hysteria associated with the new opioid epidemic admitted, and this is not something which is publicized, why? Because the lay press didn't want to run with this. They admitted that they made a mistake, that the opioid deaths were significantly inflated. Now how does the CDC admit to making a mistake? Not often. How do they do it? Very quietly. But they realized that they were lumping together patients who had received a prescription for a narcotic and died with those who, with what they were really doing, were using prescriptions, but also buying synthetic narcotics off the street. And when they started to filter the data and assimilate the data and look at it, they realized that they had overinflated the statistics related to prescription writing. I did this very same talk in the company of a few DEA agents who were quite surprised, had never read this article, didn't know that the CDC in 2018 had tried to backtrack on the statistics being inflated for prescription drug overdose deaths. So how did we get here? Well, I told you that the use of medications is a completely American phenomenon. Go back to this phenomenon here. 70 to 80 percent of all the narcotics in the world are consumed by Americans. 325 million of us, we constitute 4.4 percent of the world's population of 7.2 billion. How do we get to that mismatch? Well, part of it is our own Americanism. It's in our culture, and part of it's the lay press, right? We're inundated, that there's a right way and a wrong way to be pain. God help you if your doctor doesn't know the right way to treat your pain. We talk about pain in militaristic terms, conquering pain, beating pain. When 
George Bush was president, we declared the war on pain. Now, if you know about American history, every time we declare a war on something, it fails, right? The war on poverty, that fails. The war on obesity, that fails. The war on lack of education, that fails. And he declared a war on pain, that failed. Then Obama came in, and he wanted to soften everything. Let's understand your pain. Let's make friends with your pain. Let's not go to war. Did that work? No. We continued to have the epidemic ever increasing while Obama was president. Then we became the United States of America as you want it because we think that America needs, everybody needs marijuana for everything that ails you, for every pain condition, for every sleep disturbance, for every marital discord, just get some marijuana and you'll be fine. But being Americanism, we understand that conceptually we have a problem with addiction, but Americans don't want to confront the issues that lead to addiction. We want a vaccination. Let me continue to take my oxycodone, let me continue to take my Xanax, but why don't you shoot me up once a month with a chemical that won't let me get addicted? This is the way of the American mindset, the entitlement. We don't want to do work. We don't want to confront the problems. Give me something to combat whatever it is that you consider to be evil and wrong. I have an addiction? Okay, I got an addiction. Give me the vaccine, I'll be fine. And then we sensationalize all the deaths of people across this country who've succumbed to addiction, right? They become heroes. Big heroes, so he's a Russian world of pain. This guy is an addict, he survived. And the people who've died who've become heroes. National celebrities, even if they weren't already. Michael Jackson, the king of pain, huge hero. Yay, Michael, you had a great career, you had a great death. You were only taking Vicodin, Dilaudid, Xanax, Dolaudid, Emerald, Visceral, Paxil, Prilosec on the time of your death, not to mention Propofol, but you're a big hero. Whitney Houston, big hero at the time of her death, great career. Found chug lugging Valium and Xanax in her bathtub along with oxycodone. Prince, big hero. He couldn't even stand up on his own airplane coming back from a venue, had to be rushed, had to have an emergency landing a couple of days before his death because he was overdosing. Oh, wow, really? Five minutes, okay. Big hero, and this is Prince's last run. Physician casualties, because doctors haven't escaped this. Here's Martin Tesher, he's an 83-year-old physician from New York City, he's going to jail for, he's 83 years old for God's sakes, and he's a pill pusher. Okay, he's a pill pusher, he killed some guy in Staten Island, he's going to jail for 20 years. This is one of the casualties of the opioid epidemic. This is really the casualty right here. Todd Graham from Indianapolis or Indiana area, about my age, practicing good solid medicine. Lady comes into the doctor's office with, for the first time with some or orthopedic musculoskeletal conditions and says, Dr. Graham, Dr. Graham, I need my oxycodone. He goes, oh, hold on here. He, he was proactive, he said, you know, I don't even know you. And she, and she goes, yeah, but I've been taking these narcotics for 10 years. You've got to give them to me or I'll go through withdrawal. And Dr. Graham said, no, hold on, i got to do my exam, physical exam, check your history, go through the prescription monitoring program. The husband became irate. He waits for Dr. Graham out in the parking lot, pulls out a revolver, shoots Dr. Graham twice in the head because Dr. Graham wouldn't give narcotics to his wife on the very first visit. This happened in 2017. So what's happening now? Well, the hammer's falling, we have a domino effect. And this is America, somebody's gotta pay. Let's pay big money to make up for the fact that Americans love their narcotics. 2019 is the big year, here's the dominoes are falling. How did they fall? It started in May of 2019 when John Kapoor was indicted and prosecuted and now he's going to jail probably for about 20 years. He's a 76 year old, really the definition of the American dream, an Indian immigrant, worth $875 million. He started this little company called Insys. They made a, a fentanyl product but he distributed it wrong. Here's Kapoor right here. From 2012 to 15, he and his colleagues uh, conspired to bribe practitioners in pain clinics to induce them to prescribe insus fentanyl-based pain medication. This guy's going to jail for the rest of his life. He's worth $875 million. It's the end of the American dream. The next hammer to fall happened on September 11th of this year when Purdue Pharma <coughs> decided to go out of business. Wow, that's an interesting concept, right? You've made $15 billion a year for the last 30 years, now you're gonna go out of business. So what's gonna to happen to them? So Purdue Pharma is going to declare, declare chapter 11 bankruptcy, they're gonna close shop, they're gonna reinvent themselves as a, a company, uh, really to continue selling the same medications, but the profits are gonna to use to pay for the lawsuits and donating drugs for addiction treatment. They're gonna pay $3 billion up front over the next seven years. The next hammer to fall fell on October 21st, 2019, so three days ago, the next hammer fell, the drug giants are seeking to close out this whole opioid epidemic scandal by paying $50 billion. Okay, I'm gonna show you where it comes from. There was a $260 million settlement that happened in Ohio that started the ball rolling. So, McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, which distribute 90% of all the opioids in the world, agreed to pay upfront $215 million 
uh, and this other company in Israel called Teva that manufactured generic drugs agreed to pay 20 and then $25 million. And at the end, they're going to look to, this is only for one state now, mind you, they're looking for a global deal to pay out $48 billion over the next 20 years to settle these lawsuits. $48 billion, anyone have a concept of how much money that is? $48 billion, but it doesn't address the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that the American person loves their narcotics, they love their firearms, they love their tobacco. Unless we change the culture, unless we educate people, starting in infancy, right out of the womb, from the first day, before their first word, shouldn't be mama or papa, it should be no, no drugs, no drugs. Unless we teach kids in kindergarten, right? Nancy Reagan had something, she said, just say no, but she should have started at a much, much further age. You can't change adolescents, you can't change adults, you can't change older people. And Johnson & Johnson, of course, is kicking in $22 billion. So let me finish up in the next two minutes, okay, if I can. Am I already over time? All right. What's the future? Well, so the future is we, as, as clinicians, as practitioners, as people who work in healthcare, we've got to identify high-risk patients. How do you do that? How do you identify high-risk patients? We've got to do exams. We've got to identify, stratify risks. We've got to improve functionality, avoid long-term opioids, educate patients. And high-dose opioids should be reserved only for the most egregious cases of severe pain. Level one medicine says comprehensive assessment is important. Establish appropriate physical diagnosis. Stratify patients based on risk. Establish treatment goals. Remember, patients don't come into your office or your practice with the scarlet letter of A emblazoned upon their breast. A for addict, uh, um, in this case. Not for adultery, right? They don't come in and say, here, I'm an addict. They come in in the obfuscate. They hide all their behavior. They don't tell you exactly what they want, but they're here for narcotics. So who's at risk? Men below the age of 45 years old with a family history or personal history of alcohol or substance abuse, cigarette smokers, that's the